So I realized it was probably just a regular week for you, Paul, but that was a crazy week for me. It was kind of busy for me too, only in the not video game sense in that I hardly played anything this week. You were busy too? Yeah, but you know, like handyman work and stuff, getting the sprinklers oh, working, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's got to be done. Yeah, uh, the rest of my family is working outside the house and doing all this landscaping, gardening, and getting up a porch swing, and my goodness, uh, um, my wife and my youngest son completely redid our back porch area and changed it. The, the previous owner had these blinds. What do you call the Like, it's a lattice of wood. There's a word they've been using for that. It's a lattice of wood, but uh, it was yeah. facing... It was facing away from, like, when you look out the window, you're looking at that stuff. But off to the side oh. where the neighbors are, it was open. So it was open so that you didn't have any privacy, but it did block your view. <laughs> <laughs> so they changed that around and hung up a porch swing, and it was real nice. So they had a busy week, too, only they were doing useful stuff. And I was watching streams and reading about video game publishers that's what i did all week the same thing we do every every week pinky <laughs> and at the end of all that e3 nonsense i kind of was like is there anything in there i'm really looking there was a lot of things i thought oh that's that's interesting maybe i'll care about that but there was I realized there was nothing I was excited about. The things I might be excited about, like the Tiny Tina announcement, were like no gameplay. They're all, you know, 2022, yeah. 2023 games. I am not excited about anything coming out in the immediate future. Which is weird because I remember being in 2019 going, oh my gosh, next year is going to be insane. There are so many games coming out that I've just got to have. And then 2020, everything got delayed. So you would think, oh, 2021 is when we're going to get all that awesome stuff. And no, the stuff I was excited about in 2019 still isn't out. Ah, yeah. In fact, most of it vanished. Kerbal Space Program 2, um, Vampire the Masquerade 2, they both vanished. I see you listed the Outer Worlds 2 trailer. Yeah, that was a high point of the show for me. I, right? I just oh. I just love the, the total self-awareness. And like, it's, it's um, very understated, right? Because it's like very right. impressive graphics, but then admitting, hey... This doesn't tell you anything about the game. Why are you watching this? Well, because it's exactly the things that we're describing. It's like, oh, wow. What, what chutzpah. <laughs> right? The audacity. I love it. I admire Gaul. <laughs> yeah, so, man, everyone should do their trailers like that. Uh, we'll see if anybody, if anybody in the comments recognizes that quote. I admire Gaul. Um... Yeah, so as nice as the E3 show was, and we get to see some interesting stuff, you know, it wasn't like it was this horrible thing. Uh, but what really got me excited was when Steam Next Fest started. L let me describe to you yeah. this, this, new, this new thing they're doing, Paul. What they've got is um, they let you download a game without paying for it, but it's only part of the game. But you can play it, even though you haven't paid for it yet. And the game, it, maybe it isn't even out yet. And um, it's sort of so that you can test it for yourself and, and sample it. They call oh, yeah, it, yeah. Uh, I've heard of that. They, uh, a testo. They, right. No, they actually, they call it a demo, which I think is short for demonstration. Demolition, um, probably. Oh, you're right. So anyway, this is a new thing in gaming that Steam has just invented. No one's done before. I mean, a we're, free we're demo? No, wait, wait. Yeah. It's free? Yeah, it's totally free. You can play part of the game and see if you like it and then pay for the entire game if, if you do like it. Like, we're joking like around, but... Shareware. Right? <laughs> we're joking around, but it's been like 20 years since this was a thing. Once in a long while, you'd get a demo. 
But this is the biggest commitment I've seen to demos since like the 90s. And it's awesome. And there's hundreds I've... and hundreds of them. Right? And a lot of them are always, or a lot of them are really good. Mm -hmm. So, um, I actually, uh, at E3, I got excited about They Always Run because it just looked like such fantastic pixel art. I got to play that. Yes. Um, it is a super, I don't know if it's super hard. Like, I was worried it might be a platformer. I don't think it's a platform. It, it's got some platforming in it, but it's the super forgiving. It's less Super Mario Brothers and more Super Mario Sunshine <laughs> type of platforming. <laughs> Right. Although it's 2D, right? Yeah, it is 2D. But it's like, it's, you know, a better analogy is it's not Super Mario Brothers. It's more like the Prince of the 3D Prince of Persia, Sands of Time. Like, it's a way of getting around, but it's not like designed to kill you. I don't even think there's fall damage. It's just a way of exploring the world. Um, and the, hmm. the real star of the show is the combat system, which is this timing based thing. Oh, an enemy, if you hit the button at the right time, you'll automatically, you know, counter their attack and kill them. And if you, you know, you hit the attack, but the, the, the gimmick, very fighting they game. Always... reminiscent of a fighting game, right? Except with this awesome pixel art, the, the gimmick with, they always run is that you're a bounty hunter of some sort. And you've got this red cape. And under the red cape, you've got a third arm. Oh, man. So edgy. Right? It's like there are special moves that use the third arm that kind of comes out of your back. And it is, <laughs> is so it like, ridiculous. Is it like Voltron where like you have to form Voltron using those exact words? It's like use the third arm. <laughs> right. I'll form the head. It it um, it's very. Uh, I I like the one gimmick is when you hit the sword swing, you attack people both in front of you and behind you because you've got that extra arm behind you, so you don't have to worry about which way you're facing. But you know, it's all about yeah. okay, do this to break a block, do this to dodge an undodgeable attack, do this to counter a thing. So it's very much a a timing and recognition based thing. I found it kind of challenging. I got to the big boss at the end of the demo and I hit a checkpoint save with a tiny sliver of health. So every time he killed me, I had to try the fight again, being like two hits from death. <laughs> and that's, and there's no way to like, Hey, back me up to the checkpoint before this. So I can do that previous, you know, section uh -huh. and try and walk, yeah. get through, redo the health. whole level or get S plus plus rank on the boss fight with no hits. Exactly, exactly. Start the entire game over from the beginning and go through all the tutorials again and all that story Wait, what? stuff. Yeah. I, well, I mean, you know, the first level was just this, you know, lots of, pa it pauses the game and puts a little thing and hold X to dismiss this and do the thing. And, you know, it takes several minutes to get through all the tutorials of here's how to get through this and here's how to get through that and here's how this move works and, and does it like get you works. back to base before it throws you into a boss fight no no you just you go straight through i mean in the Oof. story of the game well, you're chasing this guy a, down just a demo i guess yeah right. come on like your tutorial is supposed to be self-contained so that you don't have to redo it you shouldn't have to redo the tutorial because you didn't ha have enough skill because the whole point of the tutorial is that you're learning the the interface you're not getting right. good yet you're just learning what the buttons right and i really butchered the fight just before the boss and yeah it was two hits from death so i did get through it after like five tries but that was that really pushed me to the frustration limit but otherwise i and it really made me think i probably shouldn't get this game this is just going to make me too angry. But the thing that the tragedy is, I did love it. It is so gorgeous. So they always yeah, it's run. Very, uh, it reminded me of uh, Hyper Light Drifter a little bit. Just kind of the pixel art with kind yeah. of the moody science fiction-y kind of stuff. Not quite so much neon, but yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. The other one I played is um, Road 96, which is a 
Telltale style story about trying to escape what feels like an Eastern European. Now, this is an alternate world. You're trying to escape a, you know, some fictional country. I forget what it's called, but you, you know, it feels vaguely Eastern European, and it takes place in 1996. Ah. But it is. But this is like, what if Telltale Games were really serious about their choices mattering? This thing branches like crazy, and um, every time is different. They, they even make a point in the trailer of like just showing how many permutations you can go through. It was amazing. Mm. I only got through one of them, but it was, I, I kind of kept feeling like, oh, the road not taken. I wanted to know what would happen if I did this other thing. Like, I had a chance. I was almost out of gas. Do I stop now? Do I keep going? I decided to keep going. So then I eventually get to a gas station and um, the gas station owner recognized me as one of the teens leaving the country. Like, you know, have you seen like a runaway? And oh, yeah. he threatened from the poster or whatever. Right. And he threatens to call the cops on me because uh, you're not allowed to leave the country. And, um, threatens to call the cops on me if I don't pump gas for him and just work at his place. And, but then while you're doing, and you can, you can screw up pumping gas, <laughs> give people the wrong gas or the wrong amount of gas or whatever. <laughs> um, and it, so I wanted to know, well, what happens if I do this? What happens if I do this? I saw a lie. I, there was, um, a phone. If you see one of these kids call this number. And there's a phone inside the gas station. I'm like, what if I turned myself in? Oh, right. Uh, what? And they gave you an option to call your parents. I didn't do that. So there were so many options that I could have taken. Um, and it made me want to see all of them. So very interesting and really charming. Yeah. It, it, choose your own adventure book kind of thing where you're like, oh, I want to try this and this and this. Right. And telltale always felt like it was pretending to do that and it, i think this game is actually going to do it this time based on what the trailer and what i experienced in my one run through this would be a lot more solid if i had time for more than one run and i could say yeah it really changed but based on what i saw in the trailer yes that this this is doing what those telltale games always promised us they were doing but weren't really so um yeah Game demos, man. That gets me excited for games more than a trailer. Yeah. And well, and the other thing they're doing is tons of live streams where the devs or, or whoever are playing their own game or, you know, someone's playing right. this game. And it's like, well, that's that's also really interesting because I, I love listening to the devs talk about their game and what they're trying to do and seeing right. like seeing the game and then seeing and hearing from them like saying okay well this part's not done yet or oh i i really like this how it works or or just talking about how they're feeling about playing the game and like, it's really interesting because it's difficult to get a feel for that when you just have even just a demo right you play the demo it's like okay well what are we what are we shooting for is this what they wanted are they disappointed that it isn't all that they expected you know like right. you know, how is this going to shape up and also like if it's still in development how is this going to change like what are what are they what is is done and what's not done yet so it's uh that's really interesting to to watch the streams and there's just so many and so many demos i didn't actually get a chance to play any of the games i i wanted to but like i said been busy and uh but i did watch a few of the streams and not the whole stream but just kind of browsed a bit and a few things jumped out at me life slide looks like really fun you're flying a paper airplane through it's kind of a um Right. What? Ambient, uh, very bright, colorful, evening colors kind of thing. Um, and uh, it it looked like a rhythm game. Like it kind of felt like a rhythm game, but I don't think it was a rhythm game at all. It was just kind of flying around this paper airplane along a track. It's a linear game, um, but it just looked really cool. Nuke Zone also was just like very colorful neon. It reminded me of those arcade like um, what neon wireframe kind of game, like Tron kind of. Oh, oh man, I miss those things. I haven't, I didn't see that one. That's the other thing. There are so many games. I, I poured through this list and I saw a bunch that I 
that excited me and I did not see that one. How interesting. Yeah, take a look. It's I don't know if it's any good. Like I said, I haven't played any of the demos, but I watched a guy play it and it was just like, oh yeah. I remember back in the day there was something I forget the name of it, but there was some sort of like, you know, wireframe, uh, neon color, you know, black sky, grid ground kind of, you know, right. shooting tank game kind of thing. Vector graphic kind of stuff. And it just reminded me of that. It's like, oh, good times. Just like in the old days. Um, the, the next one on my playlist that I did not get to before it was time to come into the show was Industria. And that one, I mean, it's an indie game, but it looks like it has such high production. Okay, the environments look like Dishonored, um, the original Dishonored, like this steampunky, it's actually newer than that, but it's, you know, that it's not actually steampunk, but it's that old building twisted streets look of Dishonored, mm. cobblestone streets and, and uh, old, old style buildings, okay? Um, filled with this weird technology that's sort of like pouring out of the buildings. Just oh, right, right, kind of um, Half Life Two kind of feeling of like yes European architecture, but then with like alien tech or whatever kind of encrusted on it. That's a better description than I just gave. Yes, you have nailed it. Um, and it's a first-person shooter of all things. Like, my goodness, this is an indie first-person shooter with uh, that isn't, you know, like some low-poly thing. You know, I understand why they have all low-poly game because, you know, who has time to make all those polygons? You're one person in a bedroom with yeah. a pot of coffee. But no, this thing looked, looked, like, um, looked like a AAA game to me. And uh, I was watching somebody, I was watching one of those streams and like, oh, wow, I got to. I gotta play that. Mm. That uh, that look of like old buildings with technology kind of routed along the outside of them always reminds me of uh, post-war Japan when they had all this, you know, all these air conditioning ducts and like electrical wires and stuff, and they had all these old buildings, but they didn't want to like tear the walls out, so they just like routed all this stuff around the outside, and it gives it this very. There's a lot of the anime. You get that feel from it, right? That weird like technology kind of growing over the outside of old structures and that's kind of where it comes from and it, it reminds me of that same feel only in like what if that had happened to to western europe kind of or eastern europe yeah that's very cool um, very cool i'm probably gonna play that as soon as the show's over so oh just such good stuff and being able to play it really like that was my big thing with e3 is like you watch a trailer and you're like that might be good i don't know but, the, you know, getting to play it, man. Th this should be the new E3. Yeah. This should be the way everybody does it. Show up with a demo or don't show up. Seamus, it's Steam. It is the way everybody does it. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, the big AAA companies like to pretend, you know, th that are making stuff for consoles. They don't care about the PC space. And to them, like, Steam doesn't even exist. Like, yeah, we, they think of us, they think of us, I mean, PC gamers, uh, you know, they think of PC gamers, you know, the way they think of, you know, people who play baseball. It's like, that's not, our, that's not our, that's not, those people are doing something completely unrelated to our business. We don't need to worry about them or think about them. Yeah. Oh, well. So what's going on with Minecraft Dungeons and why is that in the show notes? And I didn't see anything about that in E3. Did I miss it, or is this something you're playing? No, this is this is one of the things I've I um have been playing a little bit of this week. My son actually bought it. He they've been saving up their money and they save up their money and then they buy a computer game. It's like oh, good for you guys, I, I guess. Um, oh, I, I yeah, I I did love uh, seeing my kids take those steps to like save for things. Like the first time they get money, they just want to spend it on whatever is the first thing I can afford because I want yeah, to buy a thing. Right. I right. want to have the. I want to go to the dollar of... store, and you walk in the door, and you're like, "I want that thing," and it's like, "That's right, it's right by the door." Yes, that's, that's a roll of want. that's a roll of toilet paper. <laughs> like, why do you want that? <laughs> Because I could buy it. Fine. They're right. just finding out. Like, can I really buy anything in here? Yeah. So, so anyway, uh, my son bought Minecraft Dungeons, and they've been their uncles play it, and so they wanted to play it. And um, it is, it's not a bad dungeon crawler game. Like, it's it's really boiled down. 
you've got a melee attack and you've got a ranged attack and it's like left and right mouse button and you click to move and it's it's you know it's good it's a good it's a well-made game but it really confuses me because like what are the things about minecraft that make minecraft minecraft what is the what's the brand about right and it's about building like breaking blocks and building blocks and making stuff yeah. from your own crafting. imagination right like mining yes. and crafting D destructible terrain uh you can go anywhere infinite map uh procedural generation um and crafting stuff right and like minecraft right. dungeons has none of those things it's a limited map <laughs> you can't destroy anything you can't craft stuff and like what why why did they choose this brand other than it's got huge recognition like it, it seems like a really weird fit right that is weird i did remember seeing that and thinking that was so obvious. it's like it it's like making a telltale doom game right like it's a game you have made a version of this game that does not contain the core ingredient of the game right right psychonauts hellscape it's like well that's not really that's not really what that's about right like a cooking game starring the doom marine but it's called you know it's doom <laughs> game but you're you're cooking stuff and you're like but when do i shoot this? with hell energy right you cook with hell energy <laughs> fire up the argent reactors <laughs> oh, the great argent baking show so minecraft dungeons it it's a fine game if anyone's interested in doing a dungeon crawler that's like really boiled down and 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 fun uh great if you're looking for more minecraft and like you know more of that minecraft flavor don't go to minecraft dungeons it's a totally different thing i don't know why they put minecraft at the top of that thing it should just be called dungeons except that that's probably already copyrighted speaking of minecraft though they did release an update pretty recently uh the caves and cliffs update which has a ton of new block types and like they added stalagmites and stalactites to caves finally and all kinds of cool stuff i don't know if you've been keeping up with it i haven't um I, I did no notice that a oh, new update is out, and I sort of checked back in on the scene. Uh, Isaac <laughs> saved up his money and uh, got um, got a server for himself and his friends and was playing. And I was really Ooh. curious about... Yeah, and so I'm really curious where the game is at, and he's been telling me about the new stuff. And Well, a new stuff for me, we were actually, we've actually been talking about 1.6, which is several versions <laughs> back, but, you know, as yeah. new updates come out, old mods get updated. So it's like mods always lag several versions behind the main release, but when the release moves forward, those old, you know, five version back mod packs finally take, it, take another step forward. It's kind of funny how it works. So, uh, yeah, I think it's time to, I think it's time to revisit Minecraft again. But I have to wait until I'm done with Prey. And you haven't been playing Prey because I remember you picked up Dwarf Romantic last week. Have you stopped playing that yet? Oh my god. Well, I stopped playing because I had to. Because it was just E3 week and I had zero time for anything. But Dwarf <laughs> Romantic, I love this game. It is hypnotic. Um... I mean, just the, the time I spend playing the game sort of vanishes into a time hole. I just look up and I've been playing for an hour and a half. And I'm like, it's a little tile-placing game. How how did I just spend an hour and a half on it? This is like, this is the quintessential 10-minute coffee break game that I have somehow right. turned into a time hole. I, I love it. The music's really good, too. Um, like you said last week, it's all about matching tile edges. You you place hexes down on a grid, and it's like maybe it's got some buildings along one edge and some open field and maybe some uh, forest on another edge. And so you try and line them up with tiles already down, and that's how you get your score to go. You don't have to match anything, but <laughs> that's how you make your score go up. And your your goal is to like sort of make big chains or groups so that you can earn more tiles so that you can keep going. So it's all about seeing how big of a map you can build. And it's so good. It's so good. And you like the first time I was like, oh, I did pretty good. And then, you know, 
a couple hours later, I'm I'm still playing the game, and I realize, oh, that that first time that was terrible. Now I'm doing good. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, the first time through, they don't give you all the tile types, right? All the all the terrain types or whatever. Right. And so you're starting with a smaller palette, then you work your way up to a larger palette, and so you can't really plan around like what you're expecting to do because you don't know everything. But then you get into the the habit of like, okay, I want to build this thing and that thing, and then you start seeing all the the unlocks where you can get out far enough and there's like a little tile and you have to connect it to 100 buildings or 500 trees or whatever and, uh, and then it's like oh well so i should be planning for that and building this big forest so that i can unlock the thing or whatever it is and you start getting these long-term goals in addition to the the short-term local stuff of trying to fit the tiles together properly it's uh it's really good i love it thank you for telling me about it that uh, I would not have found that. I wouldn't have even taken notice of it if you hadn't told me about it. Thank you, Steam. Um. Oh, you have sh Hard Space Shipbreaker on here. I played that last year. Oh, yeah? You tell me what you think of it. It's probably just about the same game as it was last year. I don't know. It's still in still in early access. So I was, uh, I was playing Steam, and uh, last week, right as I was editing the last week's diecast, I think on Sunday, I uh, was playing a bit and I saw that the Rocketeer from the comments was playing Hard Space Shipbreaker. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Like, I've heard about that game. I wonder if it's any good. And uh, then the next day, Rocketeer is playing Hard Space Shipbreaker again. So, Rocketeer, thank you for persisting in this game because you got me to buy it. And it's it's pretty good. I, I actually got into it because I wanted to see the procedural generation. I, I read that they were doing some amount of procedural generation on the, the different ships to vary the layouts or whatever. And so I wanted to see that because like Proc Gen's fascinating to me and spaceship right. design is fascinating. So uh, I wanted to get into that. Um, it turns out they don't really do much. It's, it's basically modules that hook together and they'll have more more or less modules or and then they'll do some proc gen stuff on just like item scatter on the interior. So it's, it was kind of disappointing in that, in that avenue. It was also kind of disappointing in that it's very, it's aimed toward being a, like a blue collar worker simulator kind of thing where you're doing this grunt work and you're trying to do it as quickly as possible because you're on the clock and like, you're trying to, you know, get your, your tons in for, you know, 16 tons. What do you get another day older and deeper debt? That kind of, thing right and uh but like that's not very fun is it no like, if that was fun no. then people would do that for fun but people don't so it's kind of this weird thing where it's like why did you make this game this way like it's it's a little strange um so i played it yeah, a bit I... I unlocked a bunch of things and uh you know got pretty far and um but then i was like you know i don't i'm not having fun doing this so i stopped I had the same exact experience with it. This is not fun. As a matter of fact, I launched a mission and then realized I'd forgotten to do something. I, I forget what it was, but, you know, maybe there was some loadout I wanted to change or something I wanted to do. And I, I was like, oops, I forgot. So I just turned around and went back into my, into my, I don't know, little home my little nook there yeah, in the, the space station, the hab and the game's like, Oh, okay. You spent another day. You just went in and slept for 24 hours. That costs you another uh -huh. day and you got all these bills to pay. And I'm like, I went back inside cause I forgot my fucking hat game. Like, come on. <laughs> the, I sh this should be a conscious decision of proceed to next day. But no, I, you know, gave up another day and I, I, that began a death spiral for me. Like I didn't have enough money. And then I, I, I forget how it worked. Cause it was, this was last year. This was a 2020 game for me, but I remember I just couldn't make enough to like pay my bills. So I couldn't afford mm. to like get new jobs or whatever. I forget how it worked, but, and I was just like frustrated and annoyed and i just wanted to play the game and it wanted to punish me for playing the game and i was like well fine i won't play i'll go play something else that'll let me play it yeah well if you want to get back into it uh there's now free play mode where you're not like 
you can just play on any ship, any any of the classes of ships you want, and just you know cut it up and have fun. Yeah, that's and cool. there's also no oxygen limit mode where your oxygen doesn't deplete, and no timer mode where there's no like shift timer or whatever. And so that's the mode I play in. I play in like no shift timer, no oxygen depletion. I'm just there to cut this thing apart and I, you know do the whole thing in one shift basically. And, uh, yeah. and it's it's fun. It's you know low stress or whatever. But I get that that's not what they're going for. But it's also like I I'm not here for what they're going for. So right, me neither. Yeah, I really wish they had a lot more um, interesting proc gen stuff like weird ships or like strange layouts or something where you have to like do something weird to get it to come apart or, or whatever that that would be that'd be kind of cool i'm not quite sure why it doesn't work like i've played games where it does that oh you're fighting on the edge of poverty you're fighting to survive on the edge of poverty um papers please did that and i thought it was brilliant how it applied pressure to you like oh i don't care how much money i make but it applied pressure by having you need to buy food for your family and medicine and things like that and yeah. um and so that i thought it was done well in that game but in hard space ship breaker which why didn't you just call it ship breaker why, why did you yeah. have this awkward two-part there it's not like ship breaker was taken and you had to put a colon in front of it and hard well, space I think makes there is a uh, like ship breaker simulator or something where it's like actual oh, giant cargo freighters or whatever you're trying to pull stuff off of. It's kind of the same game, only like in hard space, the ships are actually really tiny. Like if you think in terms of like actual cargo ships in the real world, like these ships are just in, yeah. in hard space, shipbreaker, just minuscule. They're, they're like lifeboats almost. Right. It's like, it's the size of like a van. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's not ship breaker. It's yeah. Shuttle breaker. <laughs> It'd be cool if you had some bigger tools or like a crane or something. You got like, you know, right. some sort of like scale it up. But I don't know. I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure what they're what they're going for. It, I mean, obviously they're going for like you know, westerny company town, yeah, poverty right. thing. Right. And I and I'd have to play the game more to zero in on why that doesn't work because it. That can work. You can have games where you just like earn a living, so to speak. Um, but it really doesn't work in that game. And it really annoyed me. It felt like, oh, you're trying to say, you know what it was? It was a bunch of stuff that I didn't know. Like, oh, I, I, I meant to change out my equipment. Let me go back inside. And a day passes. And, oh, it was like, you're, there's interest. You have all this debt. And the interest ticks up on your debt and you just spent an entire day. And so you're trying to pay off debt, but you didn't get anything for the debt. It just like, yeah, you're in debt now. And it would have been a more interesting thing if like part of the game was you chose to have this debt. Okay, I'm going to borrow all this money so I can start my ship breaker company. Mm -hmm. But it. It, and it would felt like that's something I chose to do. And instead, it's just the game sort of drops it on you. Yes, you have a bunch of debt. Pay it off. And I'm like, well, I don't want to. Yeah, it would be, it'd wanna. be better if there was some sort of game outside of that, even if it was really minimal, just so you could have the contrast of like, you're making nothing right now, right? You're, you're scraping a living out of rocks or whatever. And then there's this always this option. Hey, go work for whatever, make a corp people, and you'll be making so much money every day. And it's like, but there's this debt that you gotta accept, right? Or even if it was just part, even if it was just part of creating your character, like, oh, create your character, and then the last page is like, you know, the what they did in um, Papers Please to show how poor you are to begin the level. The button isn't like begin. The button is walk to work. And mm -hmm. I love, I loved that little detail where you could just feel what it was like, even though they don't show your house or anything. And this could be, you know, create your character. And then, you know, the last page is, is sign here to accept your. Well, to so they have added that actually. There's, when you start the game now, there's this whole 
series of things you have to accept and you put your thumb on the thing and you check the check boxes and uh, it gives you a breakdown of your debt now. It's like, you know, this many hundred thousand for like the cryo freeze and this many hundred thousand for fuel for the shuttle to take you up to orbit and, you know, all these things, it breaks it down. Um, so there is some, some flavor there, uh, but That's it's still, cool. at the end of the day, it's still the same thing. So I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, anyway. Yeah. I, I didn't fall in love with the game, even though I thought it was a cool idea. Yeah. The, well, the other thing that bugged me about it, other than the lack of proc gen and that the ships are so tiny, was that it's in space. And so you should be able to just like kick something and it should just keep moving forever. Like it's not going to slow down. It should never just stop because right. there's no reason for it to stop. Um, but they do like there's, it's like you're underwater or something and there's all this sluggishness to everything and like, it's fine. There's these huge things and, you know, you're trying to move them really slowly, but, um, first off, there's a limit to how much you can actually move. So in space, it should, there shouldn't be a limit, right? You should be able to just like push on it and it'll start moving in that direction, no matter how much it weighs, it, it'll move really slowly, but it'll just move and eventually it'll come apart. You know, you can do the thing. Um, so the limit thing really bugged me because like, well, why can't I just shove the whole ship into the cycler, right? Right. <laughs> like, I'll right. get yeah, half credit for it or something, but you know, that's not an option. There's like this hard limit on how much you can move. And then the other thing is it does slow down and stop. So you'll like hook a tether to something and it'll start it moving and you can see it like drifting off and then the tether will break and then it'll just kind of like drift to a halt. And then you have to get another <laughs> right. tether. And you don't have an infinite number of tethers, then you have to like go back to the shop and like buy more tethers. It's just, it felt, okay. It felt like not only was the, in, in the setting, there was this like obstructive overbearing corporation that was breathing down your neck for this huge debt that you didn't really want to accept, but that the game designers themselves had created a system that was obstructive and overbearing kind of breathing down your neck. In, in like in contravention to all normal sense of like space. So it, was, it just felt like a betrayal on both levels. And I, I don't know. I resented that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm remembering more as you mentioned this. I'm bet that's what I forgot. I went out for my shift and I'd forgotten to buy tethers. So there's like literally nothing I could do. So I just wanted to duck back in and get some tethers. And apparently yeah. I, I accidentally you took off my spacesuit and slept for a day. <laughs> Yeah, you can now buy stuff outside the hab. There's a little vending machine where you can buy more tethers and more oxygen and more fuel without ending your shift. Oh. I don't know if it was there oh, before, nice. but... If it was, I missed it. Anyway, oh well. Let's move on. Let's do some, uh, let's do some mailbag questions. What do you say? Yeah. Th this one's an interesting one. Dear Diecast, an interesting reason that some people have unique perspectives on games may be that they were hidden behind a culture blind. They were unaware and thus unaffected by the reaction of peers, media, and marketeers, marketers to the product. They have a self-formed opinion. Into Oh, I didn't realize how long this was. In 2011, I was immersed into World of Warcraft so completely that I had no awareness of the wider gaming community. I didn't know that Mass Effect 2 existed, that the Wii U was a touchscreen peripheral for the Wii. Skyrim brushed against my awareness and I didn't know about Dragon Age 2. When I got around to playing Dragon Age 2 in 2014, I adored it. My two complaints were the consoleized combat system, which removed the companion tactics queue and the cave aesthetic, which got a bit old. My perspective formed without preconceptions due to my WoW culture blind. When I now read reviews of the 2011 to 2013 games, I more often than usual strongly disagree with points made. It makes me think that there is an immense effects, effect, almost a massive effect exerted upon us. I added that. Uh. Exerted upon us by culture and that this if effect informs our opinions more than we realize. Do you have any games that you played with mineral, minimal preconceptions? How do you think marketing peers and reviews alter our opinions? Chris P. This question could almost be a series of articles. Mm, yeah. Yeah, that's a really that's a really good insight. Right. Like I think I mentioned it on the past show. Like I was behind a culture blind for the nineties. I didn't pay attention to gaming. 
I didn't go to mm. gaming websites. I mean, there weren't a lot back then, but there were some. But I didn't know, like, developers or publishers or anything like that. When Deus Ex Infinity or Invisible War, not Infinity War, that would be a very different game. <laughs> you got to fight Thanos. Um, when Deus Ex Invisible War came out, I didn't know that it was, you know, a multi-platform release and the small levels. I didn't know why the levels were so small. I didn't know why a bunch of design decisions were made or why the interface was so terrible. And it just perplexed me. I thought the, the developers were just stupid. Like, they were dumb. You didn't realize that big open levels were core to the experience. Right. But I also kind of assumed, oh, maybe I was, maybe I was the weird one. Maybe I'm the only, maybe everybody else complained that levels were too big. Maybe everybody right. else wanted, wanted better graphics. And so you don't know what's out there or what people want or what other people are saying. So you're just sort of like there on your own trying to figure out this product in isolation. And it's a very, I mean, I was still dealing with this even when I began my website. I'd write about a game and somebody would go, well, why'd you expect? Of course the game is like that. What'd you expect from developer, developer name here? And I'd be like, I don't know anything about them. Right. Why should I? Do I have to research the, the manufacturer of a car before I buy their car? Oh, wait, maybe I should do that. Yeah, actually, that's a good idea. But, you know, it is, it is a bit to keep up with games if you want to play a lot of games. And if you have very particular tastes, then you naturally will, will need to come out from behind your blind. But how many people are you know, on my, on my most popular video, um, of the, the new videos that I'm making on YouTube, a huge number of them are young people that had no knowledge of the original two fallout games and didn't, you know, to them, their first fallout game was fallout three. Yeah. And so they didn't have any, they were behind a cultural blind and they had no idea. And to them, it was just this really, they were comparing it to, I don't know, what were the shooters of the day? All Call the brown shoot. Yeah. They're, they're comparing it to Call of Duty and they're like, this shooter is amazing. You can talk to people and crawl through subways and it's spooky and you can get loot and go back and you can sell it. And to them, it was this incredibly deep, complicated shooter. And to me, mm. it was an incredibly shallow, dumbed down role playing game. Mm, right, right. Yeah. And I still get responses like that to my fault. Like... Somebody was like, oh, yeah, we all have to admit that those first games weren't very good and they're basically unplayable now. And I'm like, <laughs> you are so adorable, Timmy. Uh, you precocious little kid. Yeah, yeah. It's a different, it's a different audience. Again, a different audience, right? Right, right. I think the game that I played with the most that I was most blind to the, con the context in which it was made was Chex Quest, which was basically like a Doom reskin <laughs> that right. that the Chex Corporation or whoever put together. Um, but I had never played Doom. My parents forbade me. I've still never played Doom. Um, oh. And so, like, I had no it idea your brain, Paul. what this was. I <laughs> know, right? It'd be terrible. And you go to hell. Uh, so I had no idea what this, uh, what this game was referencing or what it was built on, like the, the, the milieu in which it was presented. It was just like, oh, wow, this is really cool. Like you can go around like in first person. It's like, it's like, uh, Wolfenstein only like way better because you can side strafe and it's just, you know, it's incredible. And so like for me, Chex Quest was just like this incredible piece of technology and like and you get in a cereal <laughs> box what is this it's the future this is the pinnacle of gaming yeah well and at the time like it was cribbing off of the right you know, cutting edge technology or you know maybe a year or two behind but still like it was, you know it was it was riding that wake but i had no idea about like what was pulling it and you know carmack oh. or anything like i was completely unaware of that 
Oh, so I'm looking at the gameplay footage now, and it does look like Doom. It looks like this midpoint between Doom and Wolfenstein. And uh, I think it was built on the Doom engine, though. Like, I think they just it, took the Doom engine and, like, put new sprites in or something. Yeah, there's just, I think it's just because it's so bright and there's a lot of right angles. Like, the the, the level design here is not is not up to the level of id software. And the the, yeah. the geometry is so simplistic that it makes you think of Wolfenstein, which I'm I'm sorry to insult whoever made this, but yeah, I mean, good level design is hard. And if you're promoting cereal, then maybe you're not hiring the the, the most cutting edge guys. So that was that was the best example I could think of of being completely oblivious to marketing or anything. I mean, there wasn't any marketing. It does weird. It is weird. It's just this giant labyrinth of crates and industrial spaces, like warehouses, filled with green blobs that you shoot. It's like there is nothing that reminds me of cereal here, and I don't think you want to make me feel like your warehouse, your cereal warehouse, is filled with green blobs. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're you're fighting the the soggies or whatever. Ugh. What a weird time for the, the my first experience with a um a promotional game like this is super old. It was Chase the Chuck Wagon. Was that for a a Chase product or a Chuck Wagon product? All right, I will tell you about this. It came out <clears throat> somewhat portentously the year of the video game crash, uh, in nineteen eighty three. It um the year before I was born. Oh wow. And it, this was for dog food. The very first tie-in game, game was for Purina dog food. Um, but the commercials were something about chase the chuck wagon, right? Like the okay. dog is always trying to chase this chuck wagon in the commercials, and they wanted to make a game about that. And you, you just go through a maze. <clears throat> To get to the chuck wagon but then there's this enemy that bounces around the maze it goes through the walls right it's like imagine a pong the trajectory of a pong ball overlaid on a maze right it's not colliding with the walls it's just colliding with the edges of the maze or whatever right and you had to avoid that and i forget there was a dog catcher but i forget how it worked or what it did but um it was not a deep game. It was not <laughs> a great game. And I got to play it, and it was just funny that it existed. It is so hilarious. Haha, -ha, look, a video game about dog food where you play as a dog. Like, of all the things to, like, have as the first video game tie-in product, Chex Quest is at least, at least kids eat cereal. Right. Like dog dogs don't play video games. <laughs> or or chase chuck dragons for that matter. Right. This is just all off brand. My dog, I couldn't get him to play it. He just ignored me and kept typing. <laughs> I forget how we got on this topic, but I feel like we're off the topic we're supposed to be talking about. Did you do you have any did you read any reviews of Chase the Chuck Wagon before you played it? No, yeah, back in the 80s. I mean, there were magazines that existed in maybe not in 83, but there were video game things that existed. Nintendo Power was a thing once, you know, the NES was out, but um I never read any of them. I didn't I didn't even realize most of that stuff existed. You know, I'd say I was behind a culture blind, but in the late 90s, I actually did subscribe to PC Gamer. And yet, I still feel like I had no idea what I was doing with regards to games. Like, didn't know who the developer or what publisher or what was going on or, you know, why Micropros vanish or, or any of that. Yeah, Maybe I just oh, skipped that was those... a sad day. Right. Maybe I just skipped those articles or maybe that, maybe PC Gamer didn't cover that stuff. I don't remember. I've still got that stack of magazines. I should open them up. I've got the... You can do a whole YouTube series on reading through old PC Gamer magazines. Right, I've got the world-exclusive first look at Half-Life 2. <gasps> it's cutting-edge technology. 
Uh, go ahead, take this next email. Dear Diecast, Speaking of Bethesda games, have you guys ever tried out Skyrim and Fallout Quest mods? And if so, what have you played and which are your favorite? From Donkey. Thank you, Donkey. Um, I never. I mean, that sounds like a terrible idea. Writing, writing by professionals in this industry is frequently bad. <laughs> yeah. So I can't imagine what the amateur writing would be like. And you've got two kinds of you've got two kind of quest mods. There's the one where they wisely were like, well, this dialogue isn't voiced; it's all silent. That's not too bad. And I know about this because I'll get a mod that does something else but it includes a quest it is not specifically a quest mod but it adds a gun to the game but to get the gun you have to like do a quest find some npc and do a quest for them and they give you the gun right instead of just mm. putting it in a box outside the tutorial area which is the other way of adding stuff to the game but so you'll have to do a quest and you'll go up to somebody and you click on them and there's no audio they just stare at you with a blank look on their face and there's some text appears. Now, I'm actually okay with that. I actually consider that superior to the default Bethesda experience of a voice-acted, lip-synced person that is dead-eyed and expressionless reading their vo <laughs> voice lines. It is actually... Right. It's... It's... It's the difference between looking at a still image with text under it and looking at a at footage of out of sync audio right or or like a a person who's possessed by a quest giver it's just like that's not right right like if you've got a still picture and text under it your brain fills in that detail i can imagine this face speaking to me that's fine you you don't suffer from any like ugh, weirdness, but if you've got this weird, out of sync, badly lip synced, the facial expressions don't match match the performance. You know, somebody's like really emoting the hell out of it, but the face is basically neutral. It all feels wrong and bad. So the good quest mod, so the good quests that I've run into have been the ones that were not voiced, but once in a while. One of these plucky young people will bust out their, you know, $5 headset mic and read some dialogue into their quest. Now, um, th this is the old days. I'm talking about like Fallout 3 mods, Oblivion mods, okay? So, this is somewhat understandable. But, yeah, they were the, the quests that I did play were very rough, very perfunctory. And so that scared me off of like, I'll see these popular mods of like, oh, here's a six stage quest line that you can do. It was written by the community and we've got voice mm. acting for all the characters. And I'm like, nope. Now, maybe those are good. Maybe those, maybe that's a really good quest. But based on my prior experience, I always assumed that those were just a nightmare. That it was just like... Some kid reading into his microphone too loud and reading all the lines wrong. And um, I, I was not here for that. So do you have any favorite quest mods or, or is it just all, it's all bad? Yeah, it's all, yeah, the, the, I guess that's what I'm saying is the few I ran into when they were not quest mods, when they were just, you know, weapon mods or, you know, whatever, um, warned me off. So I never tried a quest mod. I had been previously warned away by the low quality. Hmm. So I do not have a favorite. And if I did have to pick a favorite, my favorite would be the ones that are un un unvoiced. But maybe people will tell me, no, Seamus, they're brilliant. They're better than Bethesda, which is, you know, not a high bar to clear. But <laughs> uh, that's possible. But I haven't run into anything like that. I haven't, I haven't been daring enough to try. All right. Hi guys. Oh, that is not Dear Diecast. Hi guys. While it was no fun for 13 Window, or I mean Seamus, to be in the hospital, special shout out to Paul for the shameless less 
shamelessless diecast. It was fun and refreshing hearing all your memories about gaming with your significant other. Made me reminisce about mine. In the last diecast, someone mentioned programming for dead consoles. It made me think, have you tried virtual consoles such as the Pico 8? And what's your thoughts on that? All right, so that's like one question. Um, let's, t let's tackle that. I didn't know this was a thing until I read this email. Did you hear about this before? I have not heard of the Pico 8, although uh, a number of the, what, the Zachtronics games have virtual consoles built into the game. Like, um, I know Shenzhen IO has one, and uh, with, uh, Exapunks has one as well. And I've played around with them a little bit, and it's it's really interesting that there's like a, a little game console inside using the mechanics of the game that you can use to program it and make it do stuff. Right. I I knew about those in the Zactronic games. And you'll you'll see fictional game consoles within a larger game. But there are apparently virtual console consoles and we're not talking about console windows here. We're not talking about the the DOS box window. We're talking about like console gaming. There are consoles that have never been built. Somebody made the specs for how they perform. It has this colors. It has this display properties. It has this resolution. And then people will, and here's how the processor works. And then people will make games that meet that, to that spec on that platform. As if, as if this is a long dead console that is now just being emulated. Like it's a console that's only ever been emulated. And never right. physically built. That is, yeah. I love this idea. I love this idea, especially the weird stuff you could do. Like, what if you were, I would love to see sort of alternate world. I don't think people are doing this, but I would love to see alternate world, alternate timeline consoles. What if, this is something I've thought about for years. What if processors didn't double in speed every 18 months like they did for you know, 30 years. What if they had stagnated so that we were still having like Atari level performance, but we continued to have more memory? Like what would somebody do with an Atari that had 64K of memory instead of 4K? Hmm. Could you make a more interesting game than with that? Or there was this thing that happened in the early 90s. Um, there was like one fab factory that made most of the memory for the world like most of the computer memory and it had some sort of disaster and so memory spiked in prices for a long time and it, you didn't get memory upgrades what if that had continued for years but processors continued to get faster so you've got like playstation 2 levels of technology but you're still got this little dinky like you know, like one megabyte of memory. Actually, mm. I should look up, make sure that PlayStation 2 didn't actually have just one megabyte. It's hard to remember what all the <laughs> limits were back in the day. Like it all, yeah, yeah. it was all such a big deal at the time, but now it all blurs together. Uh, 92, how much memory was a lot? Was that 16K or was that 64K or was that 128K? Like, I went through all those eras, but I can't match them to the years. But whatever. Yeah. What if what if you had, um, you know, year 2001 processor speeds, but 1992 memory limitations? What would that console have looked like? And what sort of games would have existed on it? I would just, I would be so fascinated to see that. I mean, that's kind of what embedded systems programmers do for a living. <laughs> Yeah. Probably a lot of satellites in orbit that are that exact problem. The Pico 8, I, I just looked it up and it's charming. Uh, I haven't I haven't played it yet, but that looks like something I'd like to try out. Right? It's just... Yeah, oh, they call it a fantasy console, which that's just such a fascinating thing. And all the games look so good. It looks like this is a... Con it looks like it's a console you haven't heard of, but that really existed. They've even got like box art for all the games. Yeah. Well, I'm it sure that so there cute. are. Is it is it a, a community project? It seems like those are just like the best of right. the, the ones that have been made, right? 
and they they collect right. them from the community and showcase them but even so right and dump um, you know i like i just went to the pico 8 website and they've got like this thing that rub runs in a web window and when you turn it on it um it actually has the boot up where you like old um arcade games used to have this where when you boot them up they'd have a bunch of garbage on the screen during their post to just like test right. all the sprites so you debug it if it doesn't yeah launch properly right. or whatever um so like i love that it does that <laughs> love that you built that into the system yeah so adorable i love it that's what i think of it i love it in a sense like itch.io is a virtual console right or even like html5 is kind of like a virtual console i guess it doesn't have hard specs though there's no like you can only use this much but you can use five gigabytes of memory if you want it just will run like terrible mm, yeah true and I like the hard, I love the hard limits. I feel like programming was more interesting back when programs themselves were simpler, but written under tighter constraints. Now you have this endless complexity that you have to deal with, but, oh, it's easier because you've got tons of memory. And it's like, I'd rather just have 64K to fill up, but be able to do, you know, uh, you know, just see what I can do with that. Yeah. Yeah. It helps to keep it scope creep out too. Cause it's like, well, we don't have space for that. We're just going to keep right. trying to make what we're doing fit in memory. Right. We don't have time for your stupid voice acting. You got 64k, <laughs> you got 64k memory. We can't put voice acting in there. Heck we can't even put text in there. Like right. <laughs> back in the day, like just Prose would take up so much memory that it was literally expensive to have written words because, hey, that that two sentences of exposition could have been, you know, a half page of machine code to like do all this crazy stuff and move sprites around. So yeah. Expensive. Yeah. And all the weird shortcuts you do to like do ad hoc compression before there was the modern compression right. algorithms. Right, and it had to be so... Yeah. Oh, it was such an interesting time. It was very fleeting, though. I mean, it was just like a decade and a half at, the, at most before things, you know, once once we started, um, like, mouse-based in GUI interfaces and stuff like that, everything became 10 times more complicated, but we had so many more resources that nobody cared. And we kind of yeah. lost that raw writing directly to the metal. Not that not that we should have stayed there forever, but that was an interesting time. Uh, let me let me finish reading this email. Why do you think a few years ago, I'd say mid nineties, because I was young and naive, there's in, this impression that we, or at least I, bought less games but played them to death, even not very good games. Um, you know what? I I think I think I'll I'll leave it there, and we will end the show on this question. Take care, everyone. Cheers, Erlac. Or ear lack. This man has no ears. Lack of ears. Um, yeah, so uh, this is definitely the case for me. I don't know if, what it was like for you, Paul. But yeah, back in the 90s and early aughts, I would just play a game. And if it was terrible, that was my game this fiscal quarter. And if, that, if I bought Invisible War, then that's what I played. I went through Invisible War. I went through Invisible War like four or five times. Today... If I ran into a game that shoddy, I I wouldn't even <laughs> I wouldn't even complete it once. I wouldn't even get halfway through. I'd just drop it, and move on to something good. But yeah, back then, you just play it into the ground. Is that does that match your memories? I know you were you were a child at the time. Yeah, well, it was the same. Yeah, growing up, we we didn't have an infinite amount of uh, of resources to buy games all the time and so we would and there also weren't as many games like they're just the number of games that were available to buy are like the same as the number of games that come out every week on steam right <laughs> right and that was just it that was it and there weren't more coming out next week that was just these yeah. are the games for this year yeah these are the so i remember yeah. we we got civilization the original civilization game 
and we went to take school pictures and we, while we were waiting in line for school pictures we had that big fat civilization manual and we were all three of us my brother and i and my best friend andy were all looking over the manual together you know like oh and what what units can you do and what kind of things can you do and then exactly one year from then we got civilization two because it had just come out and again in line waiting with the manual pouring over specs and stuff there was like you know civilization was the game for that year maybe we got a privateer right this was like civilization and privateer and that's it what well, I, I don't even know if those came out about the same time but that's like my memory is like okay well those were the games that you could play and you know my one of my uh sons he's like four years old or five now and um he came upstairs and he's like he he got his turn on the computer and then he came upstairs and like dad i couldn't find anything that i wanted to play and i was just like boy back in my day <laughs> we yeah. we had one computer game and we liked it <laughs> we were gonna right. play that thing <laughs> It didn't matter if you didn't like it. That's when you were gonna play. We spent yeah. we spent an outrageous amount of money on this, and so that's what you get. And and we only got like an hour of computer time every day. So here, my kids have got like you know, as soon as you finish your chores and your homework, you know, and get your room clean, you can just play computer games all day. And so and and they're like, oh, I don't want to play any of these games. Like if all I played them all, and they're all boring now. And it's like, wow, that's amazing. So I, I told you know him and my daughter and we're sitting there and I was like, we only had you know like maybe one or two games that we could play. And sh and she was like, my daughter was like, what game was it? And I was like, oh, you probably never heard of it, right? Like these are these are real old games and they were actually not even that good. Like they're not even as good as the games you have now. We right. didn't have Minecraft. Didn't have Minecraft. We didn't even. I mean, Minecraft would have been impossible. Yeah. I remember having a conversation with one of my buddies in college about like wouldn't it be amazing um what was it worms if you're playing worms right and it's got all the pixels and everything you know they blow stuff up and it's in 2d but wouldn't it be amazing if you do worms but in 3d and we're calculating like how much memory that would use and oh it'd just be impossible like you know maybe in a decade you could do something like that and uh of course you know it's not quite as high resolution but minecraft is kind of like dream of like oh whoa right. you really can just like do anything and make anything and uh and Change the kids anything. have finally kind yeah. of gotten bored of minecraft but it's like it's this incredible tool it's not even really a game it's like this this possibility engine and uh but you know eventually it does does kind of the shine wears off yeah still it's a. Uh... I kind of have warm memories, even though the games at the time were terrible. I have warm memories of them just because we were just, that's all we had. And we were glad to have them. Mm -hmm. I was struck watching the uh, Steam thing, watching the Steam Next oh, Fest yeah? about uh, how many of the games there were just like graphical up res or riffing on games that came out a decade ago. Like uh, there was one that was, I don't even remember the name of it, but it was basically just FTL only with like 3d graphics but it was the same kind of split <laughs> screen you know with the, the shots yeah. going off the edge of the screen and then coming in a different angle from the other ship and it was like wow this is you know like have we actually exhausted the idea space or is it just that we have such a glut of resources available like developers and and development houses and like people working on this stuff and tools too uh you know like whole engines that are available for anyone to to get into and use unity and and unreal and all that we can just we can just not only explore new ideas but like re-explore old ideas yeah take this this old idea and just do it in a new way the the least interesting way is with better graphics and now in 3d but then you know there are other things where it's like what if it was lower five what if it was 2d what if you had these controls constraints? There's a lot of interest. It's very recombinant, right? Just like mm -hmm. taking what's already been made and making and kind of mixing it all together. And it's very interesting. Yeah. So, or like you're right. Back in the mid nineties, we just played whatever we had because there, were, there weren't any other options. That's what you had to do. Once you bit, once you beat like mist. Then you just went at, down to the Comp USA and you looked on the shelf for puzzle games and you picked up a copy of the Crystal Key, and then you and your friend in high school like played it 
together and just made fun of it because it was just garbage. But you still that's the it. way it was, and we liked it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you for the great questions, everybody. We have run long, and it's my fault again. Thanks for the questions. If you have a question for the show, our email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye. Goodbye.